Hey, good morning, everybody. Who's ready to talk about some FPGAs? <laughs> Woo, yeah, let's get started, by the All right. Uh, hey, I'm John Dunlap. I uh, work for a company called uh, GDS Security, Gotham Digital Science. Um, I do a lot of security research, reverse engineering, like to collect bad, broken software, hardware, cheap things, break them, make them release that um, magical blue smoke. And um, I'm here to talk to you guys about FPGAs. Uh, more on the level of most people in the consumer sphere haven't really encountered FPGAs, but it's happening more and more. Um, if you're really deeply ingrained in maybe uh, military or highly secretive technologies, uh, you might be more familiar with them, but um, FPGAs are kind of creeping more into the consumer space bit by bit. And if you're, say, an embedded pen tester, you might not know what kind of bad things to look for in FPGA design, uh, what kind of things to look for when you're buying and picking FPGAs, what kind of security protections are in them, what kind of anti-tamper protections are in them, and just what the heck is an FPGA. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind uh, that probably every slide in this talk uh, could take up its own 90-minute talk. <laughs> so uh, keep, keep that in mind if I move a little fast and if you're an FPGA um, sort of subject matter expert and you're like, hey, there's some complexity got missed there, uh, that's why we got to move fast. Um, so yeah, this is for people who are a little new to FPGAs. So what are FPGAs? They are field programmable, uh, as in you can reprogram basically the hardware itself, make your own CPU or state machine or whatever, and gate array as in an array of gates, but not really. In most most cases, what we're talking about is a set of lookup tables that are uh, transferred from configuration memory. So you have something like SRAM or a flash memory that uh, holds the bitstream for a bunch of lookup tables. And these approximate the behavior of gates. So if you imagine um, you have like a finite set of inputs. Oop, I'm getting feedback here a little bit. Yeah. You have a finite set of inputs and outputs for the gate design. And this can approximate ha hardware, basically. <laughs> um, there are lots of uh, hybrid variations on this. So uh, you can get FPGAs in a bunch of different flavors, and that's relevant to this discussion because they behave differently and have different security ramifications. Um, and unfortunately, I don't want to make the talk seem like I'm ever uh, advocating for a particular brand or that I'm talking about like what to buy too much, but um, what security you get often depends on what you buy, how much you pay, um, what kind of device you're asking for. Um, there's different power consumption levels, different sizes, uh, different storage methods, um, and uh, even CPLD hybrids with FPGAs. Um, you got SRAM, Anafuse, PROM, EEPROM, Flash. And I think for most of you, uh, you know what SRAM would be. Um, you would know what an EEPROM is if you're familiar with embedded devices. Uh, Flash is probably familiar to all of you. You might not have run into antifuse, and um, antifuse is one of the first topics you might come into when you're looking at tamper-proofing an FPGA. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about how one of the main uh, threat models for FPGA is making sure people don't dump the design off the FPGA. So if the FPGA has this design in some kind of storage, like SRAM or Flash, uh, it's possible to, for people to take your entire hardware design and pull it off and flash it onto another FPGA, use it for themselves. It's something you don't want. Uh, and I've used FPGA. Uh, they basically use uh, fuses that are broken to encode the design, which in most cases means that there's absolutely no way to just pull it off short of looking at it with like a scanning electron microscope. Um, even though some NFUs FPGAs actually do have a readback function that reads back the design, <laughs> which is funny, like it, they naturally wouldn't have it, people went out of their way to implement it, which is kind of goofy. Uh, if you're wondering what FPGAs are used for, like practically everything, uh, you see them a lot in the self-driving cars, military technology, uh, routers, big use, um, for especially implementing like stuff like tertiary logic uh, servers now. Intel has a whole um, sort of product line of servers coming out uh, with uh, FPGAs. If you guys aren't familiar, uh, Altera, one of the bigger FPGA vendors, just got bought by Intel. So uh, what you used to see is Altera is Intel now, and it's mostly for that server integration. Um, of course, the crypto mining people love them. Uh, the, 
Um, in case you didn't know, the, the big value add for an FPGA is you can basically make your own ASIC, right? If you want to implement crypto in hardware and have it be more performant than software crypto, you can do that with an FPGA. Or anything really that is more performant in hardware than software. That's possible. So what kind of threats are we going to look for in FPGAs? Uh, attacks against the hardware itself, attacks against the HDL implementation, um, sort of environmental problems, and attacks against the synthesis pipeline. We'll talk about that in just a second. Um, and something to keep in mind when we're talking about FPGA threats, uh, FPGA problems, is that uh, we're working at this kind of intermediate level where we are actually talking about logic, uh, but it's in the context of hardware. And that middle level isn't very easy attack if you're not a human being thinking about the uh, HDL implementation. You'll see that in a sec. So what is HDL? Uh, it's hardware definition la language. We're talking about stuff like Verilog, VHDL, uh, and sort of a way to program up hardware. So we can take stuff like wires, buses, clocks, and define them dynamically. Uh, here's an example of uh, part of the Verilog CPU. Uh, this is actually an ALU, uh, arithmetic logic unit here. And you can see um, you, you have all the like, adding, uh, XOR, or whatnot defined by the software, but it gets put out into hardware. It gets put into actual uh, gates and registers and whatnot. Um, it's a different way of thinking about things. Uh, one thing I always thought was cool about HDL is that you can do things like actually reason about literal clock cycles. So you can say every um, rising edge we do this, or every two rising edges we do this, which is pretty freaking cool. Uh, but it also sort of inserts a whole set of problems of like when do we do that, when do we not do that, are we uh, keeping our timing uh, copacetic? Uh, if you're not familiar with synthesis, uh, it's basically the compilation, if you want to think about it, where we take our HDL design and turn it into something we can uh, throw on to the FPGA itself. Um, uh, our, our, uh, <laughs> uh, here are the basic steps of it. I'm not going to go too deep into it. I could talk about synthesis for like a whole one hour talk. <laughs> Um, but we have like a register transfer level, uh, some optimizations, and then mapping onto the actual chip that we're going to use, and a, a couple of steps that mean that we're going to uh, plan out where on the die stuff is going to go, and that has security ramifications. Where we put our crypto logic on the chip relative to other stuff might affect the viability of things like differential power analysis attacks. And that is one like liberating, yeah, dangerous thing about FPGA design is that we can say uh, spread uh, storage across the chip, make it hard to read, or we could uh, spread RAM across the chip, uh, spread uh, crypto stuff in different places. Um, but if you don't do that or just let the uh, chip planner do it for you, that might cause some issues. Uh, and the final step here we're going to talk a little bit more is uh, bitstream generation. Uh, and if you want to think about the final, um, you know, you think in firmware, the image of the stuff that gets put into the FPGA, that's our bitstream. And so if you want to start talking about reverse engineering FPGAs, you want to start talking about uh, bitstream reverse engineering. Um, but before we get there, um, it's important that this synthesis pipeline be secured and there's a lot of thought going into how how you can make sure that all this stuff happens without an insider threat between each step. Um, see, another topic that'll come up when you start reading about uh, FPGA security is physically unclonable functions, uh, which is an interesting crypto idea if you haven't run into it. It's basically the idea is that we're going to uh, get uh, maybe our crypto keys or some kind of authentication logic based off of factor specific to this exact bit of silicon, right? So things will be different on each version of the device. So uh, we might do that by measuring propagation delays. Uh, we might do that by measuring voltages, uh, capacitance, uh, parity, noise. Um, there are attacks against these, but basic idea is that this stuff will vary chip to chip, and we could do something like derive a crypto key based on these differences. Um, one of the advantages being that we don't have to like put it on the device somehow. Uh, there are machine learning attacks against these. You should look into them. And there's also uh, um, bypasses against those machine learning attacks. Um, 
So how do we prevent uh, people from disclosing RP from the FPGA chip? Uh, you know, one of the like problems, as I said before, is that when we use FPGAs, we kind of have to keep our IP in a format that's usable on on the device. You know, be it SRAM or flash or whatever. Um, so how do we protect it? Uh, or how do we get it off the chip? Um, we might look to grab it uh, during configuration of the device, right? When the device is uh, being flashed, uh, as it were. Uh, a lot of FPGA devices are set up in such a way that um, the IP is transferred from storage at boot time. Every time the uh, FPGA is booted up, uh, it gets transferred across, and we might try to attack that if it's possible. Uh, or we might try to rip it directly off the storage medium itself. Um, so uh, a lot of people call this class of attacks bitstream cloning. Um, the most easy thing to do for an attacker, sort of the most script kitty thing, is to abuse readback functionality of the FPGA. And a lot of times, if it's not like a highly secured FPGA, this might just be wide open, and you might be able to connect it to uh, Cordis Prime or whatever IDE you're using to build your FPGA software and say, read me back the bitstream, and it'll do it for you without any kind of authentication. Something to look into if you're building an FPGA-laden device. Um, usually there's a bit you can set to prevent that, but on some of the lower security devices, that's not a thing. Uh, and obviously people are going to tamper that. Um, the next level would be trying to middle the bitstream somehow, right? Uh, but encrypted bitstreams are a thing. Um, and the other thing to watch out for is like sort of integrated devices. One way that uh, hardware designers try to prevent bitstream cloning attacks is to put the uh, storage and the logic on the same die so that you have to decap the chip and do something much harder uh, physically in terms of reverse engineering to get the bitstream. Uh, here, uh, this is from, um, I think it's from Altera, the, the like, uh, perform, uh, instructions for performing a readback on one of their chips. Um, so on some of the, uh, oh no, that's Xilinx. Yeah, there we go. Um, so it's super easy if it's not disabled. Um, there are also ways to activate the readback by, uh, tampering the chip itself. Uh, but once you have the bitstream that's not all, uh, roses, uh, you might have to, uh, reverse engineer the bitstream, and this is a, big problem because every single chip and every single manufacturer has their own bitstream format that is not documented, that is proprietary, and there's whole groups of people who, who like specialize in trying to reverse engineer these bitstream formats. It's not easy. We're talking about like a month of reverse engineering. Um, uh, it's security by obscurity, but it tends to work kind of okay. Um, another thing people try to do is bitstream encryption. Um, but then you have to deal with like how do you get the keys onto the device and the pain of that, um, and protecting the device from differential uh, crypto analysis attacks, um, and bad crypto too. Uh, there have been many cases of FPGAs that inherently use uh, AES CBC mode, which, if you're not familiar, has a block swapping type attack, which uh, you could use to uh, decrypt information sort of selectively. Uh, it's no, definitely not a perfect way to encrypt things. Um, and like I said before, you have to worry about how to get the key onto the device. Um, most uh, FPJ sort of working environments have something to help you with this, but it can be kind of a pain manufacturing process wise of like finding a way to like flash the keys on and keep everything copacetic. Um, for instance, keys usually put on there via JTAG. If you leave the JTAG activated, that could cause its own set of problems. Um, another thing people try to do security wise with FPGAs is implement uh, true random numbers. Um, uh, you might get these from uh, propagation delays, oscillator jitter, oscillator frequency, phase lock loops, or a dedicated hardware peripheral that does this. Uh, big thing at FPGAs is sort of um, they, one of the like higher end things you pay for is little uh, peripherals that do certain kinds of computations for you. Like you might get a um, special uh, uh, DAC based uh, multiplication unit, for instance, something you would pay extra for. And so you can get things like that for crypto. Um, uh, also, metastability, which if you're not familiar, is like if you have a one and a, a zero and a threshold for that metastability is when we have values that live in that middle middle area, which uh, in terms of like a viable FPGA design is considered to be unacceptable. But if you do it on purpose, you can use that as a source of randomness because you have this, this um, we're not sure if it'll evaluate to one or zero. It's basically truly random. 
Um, so uh, if we're trying to get all this bitstream off the FPGA, we're going to run into problems with anti-tamper devices pretty quickly. Um, stuff like fuses, anti-tamper fuses, tamper-resistant flash memory cells, um, and logic placement designs are meant to frustrate the reverse engineer. Uh, so here's a microsemi smart fusion device, and this is one where we have like an integrated design where it would be very hard to middle the storage. Um, and here's going over some of like microsemi's uh, protections that they have on here. I thought it would be good to like talk about anti-tamper and show some of the uh, some of the um, data sheets because. Uh, it gives you an idea of how common it is on FPGAs. It's actually kind of a very responsible thing of the industry. It probably has something to do with the fact that FPGAs are widely used by the military. Um, so we have uh, multiple fuses, actually. You have an array fuse, a security fuse, a program fuse, and a probe fuse, all meant to break the device if it finds that reverse engineers have been mucking about. And if you're going to try and pull that design off the FPGA, you have to uh, deal with all of that. Um, uh, they actually have uh, similar things for their flash memory, so if you're trying to pull stuff directly off the flash, you'll have to deal with that as well. Um, I like this page, though. Are the keys secure? I, I just put that up because I, I found it to be funny in their data sheet. <laughs> Are the keys secure? Yes. Uh, Zinglinx is kind of the, the uh, kings of this. They have this huge, scary list of like hardening features that you can get in your FPGA. thing to keep in mind is like all these features aren't on all FPGAs, and if you're trying to make a consumer device with an FPGA on it and you want to protect your bitstream, then you might want to read your data sheet and see like what exactly is there. Is there? Uh, they have stuff like uh, uh, logic you can put on there that will disable the device if it feels like the JTAG is being tampered. So you put your JTAGulator on there and try to brute force it, and all of a sudden you brick your device. It's a good thing to know before going in with these things. Um, let's see, anti-read back. Uh, we'll talk about ICAP in a second. And the thing to keep in mind is um, while these, uh, these features are really common, uh, as you go into the cheaper, more consumer-oriented devices, especially the older models of devices, uh, they sort of disappear. It's like a recent improvement in some ways, or especially for the cheaper devices. For instance, um, at home in my personal collection of FPGAs, I have a um, Cyclone 2 device that I bought off of eBay and a Cyclone 3 device that I bought off of eBay. Cyclone 2 has none of these features. Cyclone 3 has about half of them. So read your data sheets. <laughs> Um, another thing to watch out for is uh, disabling a protection of the ICAP is the internal configuration port. So a cool thing about FPGAs, um, in case the possibility hadn't crossed your mind, is they can configure themselves. So you can have a self-reconfiguring design that changes itself and mutates. And uh, you know, there's been various schemes for making a highly secure design based on a self-mutating FPGA, where like uh, the locations of things swapped around, the timing delays of things swapped around. Um, but then you have to worry about, is, is there a way that attacker can hijack my ICAP? Uh, and I think listing here, there are some ICAP protections in the anti-tamper list as well. Uh, here's another threat, is uh, damaging systems connected to the FPGA. And there's been some research into this as well. So um, say that your FPGA is secure from midstream attacks. Uh, what if the attacker just wants to misuse the logic on your FPGA, FPGA to destroy things? So uh, it's not uncommon for FPGAs to be connected to you know, be the glue logic for uh, various high power systems. Um, and people have come up with attacks uh, where you cause it to over voltage or something like that and uh, cause a small fire melting things, uh, whatever. Um, so uh, this particular uh, paper, was, they call it the FPGA virus, which I think is kind of funny. Um, they propose an attack they call melt. <laughs> um, which is like right on the nose. Um, and the main idea with the melt vulnerability is uh, that they're altering the bitstream, which on a properly set up uh, synthesis pipeline and FPGA shouldn't be possible, but altering it in such a way that unacceptable voltage comes out the under, other end of the FPGA and causes some serious trouble. Um, and while that might be unlikely in a properly configured setup, um, there are situations where you have um, unthoroughly defined state machines, stuff like that, where you might get out an unintended result from the FPGA somehow. So it's something to look into, uh, you know, what is your FPGA connected to and are all possible values of output considered? Uh, what if you want to just attack the FPGA itself? Uh, what if we, we don't care about dumping the flash, but maybe we're gonna uh, reverse engineer it physically, uh, which is something that 
uh, FBGA manufacturers definitely worry about, and there's definitely a whole body of research on how to do. Uh, there's techniques like focused ion beam measurements, scanning electron microscopes, uh, X-ray analysis is a big thing, uh, thermal analysis of the running uh, FPGA. Um, and, you know, depending on how much you want to pay, you can get FPGAs that are, like, hardened against these things to some degree or another. Um, and we, we might also try to uh, tamper the FPGA by placing it in a temperature it's not expecting, uh, tampering with the clock, uh, tampering the voltage, using ionizing radiation. I'm serious. This is a big thing. Um, and you want to, this uh, FIPS document here goes over some of the hardening you might want to check out for that. Um, we'll get into those attacks a little more specifically in a sec, um, but you would solve this with a you know, more robust circuitry, essentially redundancy, uh, voltage regulation, uh, secure cryptographic implementation, uh, and uh, like a DAC-based shutoff or when the temperature's wrong. In fact, I think Zillings back on the other page has like some kind of anti-temperature tampering thing. Um, and then there's like physical isolation. Uh, which Zinx calls like isolation design flow. And it's the idea that if you have some kind of uh, secure function that you think is really important, you don't want tampered, you can put it somewhere else on the chip and have it live in its own land, uh, which is an interesting good idea. It's not automated in most FPGA programming environments. Um, and then uh, idea that comes up a lot is the single event upset. And when we're talking about radiation, this is a big deal. Um, so usually it's in the context of people uh, in a high radiation environment. Uh, but it's something an attacker could try to use to get that a chip to glitch, essentially. Um, but uh, FPGAs are especially uh, vulnerable to this uh, situation where um, some ionizing radiation causes, causes a bit to flip or some memory to change. Um, NASA has a document on this. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of suggestions of how to, uh, to secure the FPGA against it. Um, when we talk about soft IP in a second, uh, there's a bunch of companies that offer soft IP that's supposed to secure against it. Uh, but you know, if you're in a like high intensity threat environment, you might you might want to think about radiation proofing your uh, FPGA. Well, here's a guy at BAE doing radiation testing, which I think is freaking cool. Um, so uh, FPGAs also have like something like a library, right? Uh, and these are usually called IP blocks. Um, and they're HDL designs provided by third parties. Um, and they're usually provided by your device manufacturer, your ID, whatever you're using, like Cordis Prime or whatever. Uh, we'll usually come with a bunch of these that you can license from Intel or uh, Xilinx or uh, whoever it may be. Um, and it can be really ornate stuff like entire CPUs that you can customize to your needs. Um, you know, here's just a drive at home. Here's the uh, Altera IP blocks menu, and you can put in all these. All these functions are just drag and drop. You know, stuff is complex as CPUs, RAM, state machine. Um, and, you know, it's an overlooked thing that if you have a design uh, with FPGAs, you might want to get your IP box checked for vulnerabilities as well. Uh, what about cryptographic attacks? Uh, the same kinds of uh, DFA attacks that people worry about for other kinds of embedded systems are a big deal for FPGAs as well. So, uh, you know, timing-based attacks, side channel attacks, power analysis, uh, uh, glitch attacks. Um, not much to say here that's different than other, other stuff other than uh, you, might, you might take advantage of the routing and physical placement properties of the FPGA to try and counteract that. Um, we talked about glitch ejection before. And getting towards the end here, um, we talked a little about security tools for FPGAs and what you know, some more HDL-oriented analysis might entail. Um, you know, one thing to keep in mind with FPGAs that's really cool is stack analysis uh, works really well on FPGAs. Actually, uh, some of the stuff, if you're familiar with, uh, like, SAT solvers or uh, formal methods or proof-based security measures, this is very mature on FPGAs, but for different purposes than maybe security people are used to, uh, it's oriented more towards um, uh, defining correctly the electrical uh, properties of FPGA, making sure that we don't have things like that metastability we talked about, making sure that the uh, clock can run at a stable rate without causing um, uh, propagation delay-based errors. Um, it's not so much for security, but it could 
help you with security. You know, uh, usually uh, stack timing analysis tools can do things like detect unconstrained paths. That might be a security problem. It might not be. Um, but that'll come with your uh, design suite, right? But there are problems at the intermediate level with finding bugs in this. It's not going to find logical bugs, and it's not going to know unless you help it along um, about security errors with uh, data flow, right? Um, the stack timing analysis uh, can't tell, for instance, uh, where your data is going and which of it's supposed to be secure. Um, can't answer questions like, can the user write to arbitrary memory? Uh, none of this stuff is even like in the purview of that type of analysis. So this is really good uh, stack analysis, but it, it doesn't fulfill the needs of like what a security engineer would be looking for necessarily all the time. Um, I think one of the coolest in getting along to like the same idea everyone's having about how to do security stack analysis on FPGAs is this tool from Cornell uh, called SecVerilog. And the basic idea is like one of the like biggest problems on uh, FPGA design security is like where that secured information is flowing. And so uh, SecVerilog is basically an extension to the Verilog language where we are able to annotate which bits of our data are secure and it will trace that by um, injecting Verilog uh, at various levels and areas uh, and give us an idea of what's going on. Uh, and you see a lot of like transpiler ideas in this zone. Um, to give you an idea of the kind of ideas like a human would find that the stack analysis tool won't, uh, we're looking for like bad state transitions, uh, data flow to unintended areas, um, timing sensitive problems, um, places where people should or should not be checking the clock or they're do doing so incorrectly, uh, race conditions, uh, places where you're assuming you're in a synchronous mode of, inf uh, of operation but it's actually asynchronous or the opposite, um, uh, aliasing issues. And that's basically it. I don't know how we're doing on time. Let's see. Oh, pretty good. So um, since we're good on time, do we have any questions from the audience? Dead silence. How many of you guys have uh, worked with FPGAs before? Oh, cool. So you guys are all, all like, oh, this was too low, high level for me. Okay, I gotcha. It's okay. All right, well, I'm out then. Well, a question, yeah, what's up? No, I haven't seen that. Um, although, I don't think it would be hard to put together um, uh, some of the schemes I've seen proposed are taking uh, something like, uh, I know that there's a GNU VHDL compiler that uh, basically turns VHDL designs into um, native code for Linux. I don't think that would be hard to instrument in the same way. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, most of the literature is in the form of like uh, alpha particles. Um, we, I don't know that the number off the top of my head, um, but there's an interesting, um, it might be the opposite of what you think, like less is more. Um, there's sort of an annealing process that can go on when you when you slam the chip with like lots of radiation as opposed to a little bit intermittently where the uh, chip will be more reliable um, <laughs> more reliable with more radiation than less uh, and that's one of the problem if you look into there's a whole lot of literature and like how unreliable the industrial testing can be on on that if you're not careful all right well, have a good day, guys.